you know that feeling. You're looking at a building project, maybe a renovation, and you're just swamped with information. Foundations, floors, different methods. Mm. It's a lot. It really can be overwhelming. Well, think of this as your uh, shortcut, your quick guide. Mm. Today, we're really getting into one specific innovation, beam and block flooring. And suspended foundations, too. Right. We've sifted through quite a bit YouTube videos showing how it works, uh, technical documents, all sorts. We've pulled out the key stuff for you. Yeah. Our mission basically is to get a solid handle on these beam and block systems. You know, what they are, why they're useful, how they're actually made. Sounds good. Let's jump in. Okay. So first things first, what is beam and block flooring exactly? Well, fundamentally, it's a pretty smart system. It pairs up two main things, mm. pre-stressed concrete beams and um, hollow infill blocks. Hollow blocks, okay. <laughs> sometimes called eco blocks, I see. Yeah, sometimes. We can touch on the eco part later. But the real cleverness is how they fit together. They interlock. Ah, interlocking. That sounds like the crucial bit, doesn't it? Like a custom design kit that just slots together. Pretty much. For strength and, well, it makes it efficient to put together. What struck me was how flexible it seems. The, the sources suggest it's not just for one type of building, right? Not at all. It's really versatile, classic styles, really modern stuff, weird shapes. It can adapt. It's designed to be tailored. Okay, makes sense. Now, the big question, why choose beam and block? Why not, you know, the old ways? The benefits list look long. Ha, huh. yeah, there are quite a few potential upsides. Speed is a major one people right. talk about. Installation speed. Right, getting it done faster. Exactly. Because the main parts, the beams, the blocks, they're made off site. So putting them together on location is, well, quicker. Less mucking about on site. Uh huh. Which can mean real time savings. You might finish the project sooner. We saw it's especially good for things with repetitive layouts, like, say, apartment blocks, really speeds things up there. And time is money in building, isn't it? Mm. So faster install. Probably saves cash, too. That follows, yes. Less waste is one thing. You're not using as much temporary stuff like timber or steel supports. And quicker work means potentially lower labor bill. Right. Optimizes materials and time. Pretty much. Okay. The floors need to be strong. Really strong. How does beam and block perform there? Load bearing. Oh, it scores very highly there. Those pre-stressed beams are engineered specifically for heavy loads. Very solid, very stable base. One dot called it a highly robust structural floor. Robust. Good word. And durable, built to last. That's the idea. The concrete and the whole system design are geared towards longevity. You see, durable, long-lasting, mentioned a lot, stands up over time. Makes sense. What about safety? Fire safety came up. Yes. Concrete itself is inherently fire resistant, so the whole floor system gets that benefit. It adds a significant safety layer. Good point, actually, if you're thinking about things like underfloor heating running through it. Ah, uh, okay. Underfloor heating integration. That sounds handy. And noise. Nobody likes noisy neighbors upstairs. It generally performs well for sound insulation. The dense beams plus the blocks, they create a decent barrier. Quieter between floors, more comfortable. Comfort's also about temperature, right? Is it good for insulation? Keeping warm, keeping cool. Yeah, it contributes positively to thermal insulation. Helps keep the building's temperature more stable. So cozy in winter, hopefully cooler in summer. Might even save a bit on energy bills. That's always a plus. And nowadays, everyone's thinking green. Is there an eco-friendly angle here? There can be, yeah. Precast concrete itself can be better than pouring on-site less waste, more controlled. But also, you mentioned the eco beams. I did. Some makers are specifically using recycled steel. You might see D16 grade mentioned and lower carbon concrete mixes. So actively trying to reduce the environmental impact. Okay, so using recycled stuff, lower carbon concrete. And does the way it's customized help with waste too? Good point. Yes, because they can make the beams to measure. Basically, you don't end up with loads of offcuts on site, less waste generated overall, more efficient use of materials. And thinking about the building site itself, having these pre-made parts must be easier logistically, less storage needed, maybe less risk of stuff walking off. That's a fair point. Less sprawling storage space needed compared to piles of raw materials. And yeah, maybe less attractive for theft than, say, timber or copper pipes. What about actually putting it together, mm. handling the beams, the blocks? Is it super specialized work? The sources suggest it's designed to be fairly straightforward, easier handling. Some even say it's manageable for like experienced DIYers or with less skilled labor. Obviously, safety procedures are still vital, but yeah. Sounds very adaptable. 
ground floors, upper floors. I even read about tricky sites, uneven ground. Exactly. It's good for those problem sites. Sloping ground, high water tables, where traditional foundations might struggle. We even saw it used for rooftop terraces. Solid base up high. Can weather. Does rain start play as much as with other methods? Less so, often. Because it's assembly rather than, say, pouring massive amounts of concrete that needs to dry, you can often keep going in weather that might halt other work. Fewer delays. Right. And no shuttering. That was mentioned. Why is ditching the shuttering a big deal? Ah, shuttering. That's the temporary wooden or metal molds you build to pour concrete into. With beam and block, the beams are the structure. No need to build molds. Wait, then to take them down. Saves time, saves materials, saves labor. Just simpler. Got it. And for people who like things neat, hiding pipes and wires. Yes, those hollow blocks are perfect for that. You can run underfloor heating pipes, water, electrics right through the cores inside the blocks. Keeps everything tucked away. Cleaner finish. Nice. One last benefit mentioned, earthquake resistance. Really? Well, yeah, in some contexts. The system's inherent strength, especially when used with other reinforcing elements like plinth beams, can offer better performance in seismic zones compared to some lighter or less integrated construction types. Wow. Okay, that's a lot of potential advantages. Hmm. Let's switch gears a bit. How are these crucial pre-stressed beams actually made? What's the process? It's quite a controlled um, industrial process. Starts with careful material selection. You need high tensile steel strands that's vital for the pre-stressing and very strong concrete, usually class 60. Class yeah, 60, that sounds strong. It is. Signifies a high compressive strength, which you need for this kind of structural work. And pre-tensioning. That sounds like the secret sauce. Can you break that down a bit? Sure. So before they pour any concrete, they take these steel strands and stretch them really tight in a long mold or casting bed, like pulling a rubber band taut. Okay. This tension puts an upward curve or camber into the beam's potential shape. Later, when the finished beam is put in place and weight comes down on it, that built-in upward force counteracts the load. It makes it incredibly strong and stops it sagging or cracking under tension. Ah, I see. Like it's already fighting back against the weight before the weight is even there. That's a good way to put it. And the amount of tension is calculated precisely for the load the beam is designed to carry. Clever. Yeah. So steel stretch tight, then what? Then they pour the Class 60 concrete into the molds, making sure it completely surrounds those tension strands. Very carefully controlled pour. After that, it needs to cure. Cure? Like, just sit there? Essentially, yes, but under controlled conditions, usually for about 14 days. This lets the concrete harden properly and reach its full design strength. And I bet they're checking everything constantly. Quality control. Oh, absolutely, all the way through. They check the dimensions beams have to fit together perfectly on site. They test the concrete strength. Does it really meet Class 60? And they inspect the surfaces for any cracks or imperfections. Rigorous checks. Sounds very precise. Yeah. I also saw something about BRC mesh used during installation. What's that for? Right, BRC mesh. It stands for British Reinforcement Company Mesh. It's basically a grid of steel wires welded together. Often they lay this mesh down on the damp-proof membrane before placing the beams and blocks. Okay, so it goes underneath? Well, often it's used in the concrete screed or topping that goes over the beam and block floor. It adds extra tensile strength to that topping layer, helps spread loads, and reduces the risk of surface cracking. An extra belt and braces measure. Got it. Now, back to those eco-concrete beams we mentioned earlier. <sighs> How is making them different? Is it just the ingredients? The basic process, the pre-tensioning, the casting that's very similar. The main difference is the ingredients, like you say. The goal is sustainability without losing strength. So what specific sustainable materials are typical? Usually involves using recycled steel, that D16 grade often comes up instead of all new steel, and they use concrete mixes designed to have a lower carbon footprint during production. Or better sourcing. Does the curing change for these? Typically it's a similar controlled curing, often in a moisture controlled environment, again for around 14 days. You need to ensure that even the low carbon concrete mix achieves the required strength and durability. It's just as critical. And quality control just as tough for the eco ones. Absolutely. No cutting corners there. Same compressive strength tests for Class 60 compliance. Same dimensional accuracy checks. Same final inspections. The eco aspect can't compromise the structural performance or safety. Good to know. It feels like this quality control theme is central to the whole beam and block idea being reliable. It really is fundamental. More and more automation in the factories helps ensure every beam is consistent. Less variation, 
more reliable system overall. And all that testing isn't just ticking boxes, is it? It's actually preventing problems later. Exactly. By simulating stresses, finding any tiny flaw before it leaves the factory, you drastically reduce the risk of failure on site or years down the line. It's about long-term structural integrity. And it's not just the factory's own checks, right? They have to meet wider standards. Correct. They need to comply with British standards, often international ones too. That provides another layer of assurance about safety and performance benchmarks. We talked about the eco-materials, but does the focus on quality control itself help sustainability? In a way, yes. High precision means less wasted material during manufacturing. Efficient processes use less energy. So minimizing defects and optimizing production indirectly contributes to being more resource conscious. And right before they go on the truck, one last check. Usually, yes. A final quality assurance, maybe some load testing, definitely a visual check for any transport damage, Warm. and making sure all the paperwork matches up for traceability. Can't be too careful. A really thorough process from start to finish. Oh. Okay, let's look at another application. Suspended foundations. Sounds revolutionary, especially for tricky ground. It kind of is. The sources position it as a real alternative to traditional foundations, which, let's face it, can crack or be useless in floods, especially on unstable ground like sand or peat. And it uses the same core technology, those pre-stressed beams. Exactly the same beams. That gives the foundation incredible strength and stability, even if the ground underneath is shifting or waterlogged. You're essentially building above the problem soil. And insulation easier again. Yes, because it's that same modular beam and block system, generally quicker and less disruptive than digging huge trenches and pouring tons of concrete for traditional footings. Big time and potential cost savings there. And does it bring those comfort benefits too? Thermal, acoustic? It does. Just like the flooring, the solid nature provides good insulation against heat loss and sound transmission. So a warmer, quieter house built on top. Again, potential energy savings over the long run. What about the upfront cost? Any figures on savings compared to traditional? Some sources suggested quite significant savings potential of up to 40% on the foundation stage. That comes from less digging, less concrete, faster build times. Mm -hmm. It all adds up. 40% is huge, especially at the start of a project. Mm -hmm. Okay, nearly there. One last bit of jargon popped up. T-beams and hollow blocks. Yeah. TBF. What's that about? Right. TBF. It's another variation, really. Still focused on efficiency. Yeah. This system uses concrete beams shaped like an inverted T and, again, hollow blocks that fit between them. Inverted T-shape. And the benefit is more strength again. Primarily, yes. That specific T-shape interacting with the blocks creates a very strong interlocking floor structure. Great for load bearing. Some described it as a potential game changer for building strong floors efficiently. Interesting. It really feels like this whole area, beam and block systems, is constantly being refined. TBF, the eco stuff. Absolutely. It's all part of the push in construction for methods that are faster, stronger, greener, and ideally cheaper. Beam and block definitely ticks a lot of those boxes. Well, this has been really illuminating. A proper deep dive into beam and block and suspended foundations, too. If we boil it down, it seems like a genuinely smarter way to build. You've got speed, you've got strength. Sustainability options, cost effectiveness, and that amazing versatility works in so many situations. Yeah. Whether it's tricky ground, a need for speed, or wanting those eco-credentials, it really offers a solid, adaptable solution. Definitely one to consider. So listening to all this, maybe it makes you think, how could Beam and Block change the way you approach a building project? Or even just how you look at the buildings going up around you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe next time you see a construction site, have a closer look. You might just spot those distinctive beams and blocks going in. It feels like this technology is only going to become more common.